Welcome to Robert Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a YouTube video podcast where we explore all things cinema. I want to welcome back to the show Joseph McBride, who is the author of 25 books, including acclaimed biographies of Frank Capra, John Ford, and Steven Spielberg, three books on Orson Welles, and critical stud studies of Ernst Lubitsch and Billy Wilder, a former reporter, reviewer, and columnist for Daily Variety in Hollywood. McBride is a professor is a professor in the School of Cinema at San Francisco San Francisco State University. Joseph, welcome back. Thanks so much for joining me again. Great to be with you again, Robert. It's always fun. Yes, absolutely. And I know we talked a little on uh, social media about the new paperback release of Whatever Happened to Orson Welles, uh, a portrait of an independent career, which we'll be discussing today. Uh, and as I mentioned to you, Joseph, I love I, I just ate the book up. I mean, it's such a it's such a it's such a rich portrait of this man. And th there's so much I want to get into. But the first thing I wanted to ask, wh why um, why a third book on Wells? What could you talk a little bit about why you wanted to do this one? Well, I did a critical study of Wells when I was quite young uh, at the University of Wisconsin back in the uh, late 60s, and I finished it in, um, well, around 1970, 71. It came out in 72, and that was for the British Film Institute. And it was a, a you know, study of all his films that had been released up to that time. And I updated that in 1996, and, I'm, and that's gone out of print, and I need to bring that back into print and update it again, because Wells films keep coming out. His career isn't over, you know. He left behind a lot of things for us to um, uh, put together and release. And uh, I did a short book on his acting career. It's the only book devoted entirely to his acting in films and television. Uh, it's called Orson Welles, Actor and Director. And that's out of print. But then I uh, did Whatever Happened to Orson Welles, which uh, took five years to write. It was an hard book to write because... Uh, it's, it's an unusual book. It's a, partly a memoir of my work with him on the other side of the wind and other things. And I knew him the last 15 years of his life. So it's an intimate portrait. Um, about a third of it is on the other side of the wind, uh, in which I acted for five years. And uh, I helped get it completed and released by Netflix in 2018. Long, long process, uh, 40, oh, God, 48 yeah. years in the works. Uh, <laughs> it was kind of like a relay race, you know, and we all, I passed the baton to other people and, you know, I ran, ran the race for a while with Gary Graver, the cinematographer. Yes. Um, but I also, when I did that book, I, um, I started out wanting to talk about his later career, which isn't very well known to most people. Um, because, for example, when he died in 1985, the New York Times obituary said he'd been inactive as a director for the last several years, which was totally untrue uh, because he was shooting films all the time. So they actually had to run a, run a correction. And uh, I wanted to tell people, first of all, just what was he doing? I've seen almost all the work that he did in later years. And uh, um, then I realized, though, that he had become a completely independent filmmaker in that period, working with his own money and Oya Kodar's money, his his companion. And um, uh, but he he had always been an independent filmmaker before that term was even coined. Uh, and I was adopting a theory by Douglas Gomery, who was a college friend of mine, who's become an important film historian. And he he wrote that Wells was an independent filmmaker who briefly had the resources of major studios back in uh, early 40s with RKO and a couple times in the late 40s and then Touch of Evil in the 50s. But he was, um, in other words, we should not think of him as the mainstream media do in America as a failed studio filmmaker, but as an independent filmmaker who you know, worked for RKO briefly and made a couple of great films and uh, was basically banished from Hollywood and then he was blacklisted and went to Europe and worked on his own and and he evolved a, a different way of working and a different style as independent totally independent filmmaker and and then in, in la his later years he really didn't want to work for the studios he, he had some offers and he passed passed them up and uh, 
he was tempted briefly um, when Peter Bogdanovich, who's in the background here, rehearsing mm -hmm. with me for the first day of shooting The Other Side of the Wind in 1970. Peter had a company at Paramount briefly called The Director's Company with Coppola and Friedkin. And um, Peter was trying to get Wells to direct a film for them, and he was going to do a version of Joseph Conrad's Victory, which he called Surinam. And I've read the script. Uh, it's good. But the film fell through because um, basically Peter's film, Paper, uh, Paper Moon, did very well. But then uh, Daisy Miller, which he made for the director's company, bombed. And Paramount dissolved the company. And they didn't really make a lot of films and uh, uh, or hardly made films at all. And so that, that was the end of Wells' last attempt to, to work with the studios but he turned down projects and he told me for example john Kelly at warner brothers who was a quite an intelligent uh, visionary executive who was stanley kubrick's uh, big connection at warner's for a long time uh, wanted wells to direct a film for them and uh, he, he turned it down and he said to me he said i couldn't get up every morning at six o'clock and gary graver <laughs> told me, well, that was just an excuse because he said Orson always got up at six o'clock. He was, he actually didn't sleep a lot during the night. He would sort of take naps during the day and then he would sleep for about four hours during the night. And um, uh, Gary said he just didn't want to work for the studios. I, I think he was permanently traumatized by Touch of Evil, what happened right. when Universal took it over from him and banished him from the cutting room. And uh, later, um, he wrote a 58-page memo after seeing the version the Universal put together, uh, and uh, he was Wells was trying his best to be diplomatic and and suggest changes, very very precise changes, but they kind of ignored most of them. And but many years later, in the late 90s, Rick Schmedlin, a producer, had the idea of um, doing um, taking Wells's memo and re re editing the film and making it more like his vision. And he got Walter Murch, who's the world's greatest film editor and sound designer to work on it. And I was a, a consultant and as well as um, Jonathan Rosenbaum and James Naramore. Basically, we were just asked to give our okay. And we said, hey, good idea, you know. So it came out in 98 and, and did well and was well received. And it was an improvement on the version that had been circulating for a long time. You, you can see it's a good thing all three versions are circulating. There was a preview version also that uh, was out there. Um, but uh, that helped spur the interest in the other side of the wind. It showed that, uh, uh, you know, a classic Wells film or, you know, vintage Wells film could have appeal to the current audience. And uh, I had the idea of going with um, a cable network because we showed it to all the studios and other important people in Hollywood like George Lucas and Clint Eastwood and they, nobody wanted to finish it. And so I said, why don't we go to a cable company? And so we we had a deal with Showtime. I, I helped work out a deal. And then Oya Kodar and Peter Bogdanovich fired me because they figured they didn't need me anymore. It was rather, rather uh, abrupt. <laughs> And I decided not to um, fight it because I didn't want to cause any more trouble for this film. Uh, but that deal fell through because Zoya Kodar was very difficult to deal with. Uh, she owned Wells' rights and Beatrice Wells, his youngest daughter, was putting up objections. And uh, eventually, uh, Philip Jan Rimza, who was a, a Polish producer um, who put together with Frank Marshall and Peter Bogdanovich, a deal with um, Netflix for Other Side of the Wind. They persuaded Oya to, to, you know, make a deal for her rights. She got about, she got 1.335 million. And I had offered her 1 million back in 1998. And I looked it up with uh, inflation. It was really exactly the same amount she could, <laughs> she could have gotten 20 years earlier and used it for something, but she didn't want to do it back then. I wonder what finally made her say yes. Do, do, do you know uh, what sort of 
finally did it. I, I don't think, you know, everybody was kind of mystified by her being difficult. For a mm. long time, she was, she kept, uh, even when I was uh, kind of, you know, negotiating with her back in the 90s, um, she kept sort of playing off, um, you know, she'd get an offer and then she would try to get other companies interested to try to right. jack up jack up the offer and she kept doing this and and that would turn people off you know people don't like that kind of um double dealing and uh um philip was just extremely diplomatic and i'm i'm frankly really glad i got fired from this film because you know i would have wasted 9 years of my life uh negotiating with oya as philip did, mm -hmm. you know and the poor guy had to deal with her and uh sasha wells who's wells's nephew who some people think is actually wells's son right um he was the little boy at the beginning of f fake who wells does a magic trick with um sasha lives with oya and he's a reasonable person so he kind of intervened and kind of persuaded oya i guess to take the money and you know i mean one of the things that gary and i managed to do was to get Mehdi Bouchery, the Iranian investor uh, who put up some money for other side of the wind. And he kept, every time he put up money, well, Wells and Oya started the film with their own money. And then um, when, when they realized they needed more, the film was getting bigger than they thought. They made a deal with the Iranian uh, company, uh, Phil, uh, Astrofor was the name of the company. And they were working out of Paris. Uh, they were trying to deal with international filmmaking and, you know, help the image of Iran. Uh, but he was the brother-in-law of the Shah of Iran, and it was uh, unfortunate that he made a deal with them. But uh, Bouchery, you know, Wells would say, I need more money, and he'd give more money. But every time he did that, he took a higher percentage of the film. And, and they, Wells started with 50% um, of the film, and it got whittled down to 20%. And he was angry he only owned 20% of the film. But Bouchery, you know, I mean, he was acting in good faith, giving money. And then, unfortunately, the, um, well, unfortunately, unfortunately, the Iranian revolution happened. The Shah was deposed and, and the new regime tried to seize the property of the royal family, including other side of the wind. And two guys showed up at the Paris office of Astrofor and Dominique Antoine, who was the line producer on the other side of the wind, thought very quickly. And she said, oh, yeah, you can have the film. But, you know, she said right here, I just got this bill from the French tax authority. And you guys certainly want to pay that the bill right now, right? Because uh, we got to got to pay that. And the two guys looked at each other and left. But the film was tied up because the French courts, Wells went to court in France to try because they have more regard for the right of the author right. and the french court said yes he's the author but he doesn't own the material so there was a stalemate and um, they said Bouchery and wells have to make a deal and then wells can edit the film so gary and i i said to gary why not offer oya a million dollars and Bouchery a million and we'll budget a million for post-production. I was kind of pulling the numbers out of my hat, but I thought, let's pitch the Boucheries. Actually, I think maybe Bouchery had died by this time. I, his wife and children, I said, why don't we say to them, you're not making any money off this film, but here's a chance to make a million. And they agreed, you know, so that right. we, we overcame that big obstacle that held up the film for a long time. And, uh, but then, you know, it took another 20 years to get the film out. It's a long saga. Well, like I, that, I, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I also, I also, on your recommendation, read uh, Josh Karp's uh, book on the making of the, the other side of the right. wind. And it's, I love the book, but it's, it's also so frustrating to read because of these ups and downs and ups and downs and, and, yeah. and so many people. And it's like, how, how could this yeah. have been so so difficult that sometimes I was forgetting, well, who is this person now? And who are like all these people um, yeah. coming and going, but uh, it's, it, it's quite, it's quite an extraordinary uh, saga. But before, before we, we get more into that film, I, uh, the, I, I liked how you, in the book, you, you, the first part, you, it, 
basically show the readers how well, why, you know, where, how Wells came to be Wells in 1970 and his mm-hmm. position coming back to Hollywood after being in Europe for so long. Um, was it, how did you manage to sort of narrow down uh, his life up until then? Because oh. as you know, it could take, it could take about yeah. 15 books to write about him. So was that a, a challenge or how was that? Yeah, process? That, that's why it took five years. Uh, you know, frankly, you know, I mean, it's easier to write a long book than a short book. It's just like there's a famous quote from Lord Chesterfield to his son in, in the uh, 18th century, he said, I'm writing you a long letter because I don't have time to write you a short letter, you know. <laughs> and uh, I didn't want to write a, you know, 800 page book or something. And poor Simon Callow is on volume four of his Wells biography. And yes. he does he does other things, too, because he's a well-known actor and he writes other books. But uh, I sure wouldn't want to spend that much time or it'd be like Robert Carroll writing uh, about Linda Johnson for most of his lifetime, you know. Right. And I, I like to do a variety of things, but, um, you know, I had to do a lot of outlining and um, thinking about this and a trial and error. What I did basically, um, when I said that he became an independent filmmaker, but he was always an independent filmmaker, I realized to explain how he became totally independent in his later years, I had to go back to the beginnings of his career and explain why he was such a maverick and how what his relationship was with the film industry and why he was separate from it and and so i had to kind of tell the whole story of his career it wasn't a biography but it was about his career i called it a portrait of an independent career and so i started with um the theater you know he did uh he 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 said for example he was the only person probably who ever illegally put money into a u.s government project uh, he he would make money from the radio. He made a lot of money, and he would put that into his uh, WPA theater projects, the Federal Theater. And those plays were put on for small amounts of money. Like Julius Caesar was put on for twelve thousand dollars. Can you imagine? It was a trial. Wow. And his wife, his first wife, Virginia Nicholson, urged him not to go to Hollywood and to stay in the theater. And he said wow. later, I realized she was probably right, but he said. You know, I fell in love with movies, and um, it's the most expensive mistress a man could ever have. And <laughs> he said, "But I love her, and I can't let her go." And but um, so then I talked about Kane and Ambersons and what went wrong with RKO and how they betrayed him, double crossed him, and I found evidence that changed the way we look at what happened there because I found documents showing that. When he was making It's All True in South America for the U.S. government, which he was he felt obligated to go there, some some people blame him for uh, supposedly abandoning the Magnificent Ambersons in post-production, but they double-crossed him. They said they would send Robert Wise down there um, to finish the editing with him, <clears throat> and then Wise couldn't get a plane to go down there this was wartime and they said it was due to wartime restrictions and it may have been but um back in hollywood they were hacking up the film and reshooting it and wells was desperately trying to save it and they they literally would let the phone ring and throw away his cables and they, they wouldn't pick up the phone and but i found a um two transcripts of telephone conversations between rko executives in in their papers um they basically said we're not telling wells how much uh, the budget is for it's all true it was 1.2 million and i found other documents about that it was partly financed by the u.s government partly by rko and uh but it's extraordinary not to tell a director what the budget is of his film Mm -hmm. and then they fired him for supposedly going over budget and he was, uh, I don't have the exact figure in my head, but it was something like $450,000 under budget when he got fired. He had spent hmm. something like 750000 or um, it, it was just, uh, uh, well, you know, it was extraordinary that he was fired for going over budget and he wasn't over budget, but he never knew that. And they actually say that in the phone conversations, we don't want him to know. And so they lied, and then they put out the story that he was extravagant, and that story followed him around for the rest of his career, and he had this reputation of being this profligate 
not a controlled director, but he was actually very economical. Charlton Heston, who started Touch of Evil, said Wells was the most uh, efficient director he ever worked with, which is a high compliment considering all the people Heston worked with. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw on the other side of the wind, uh, Wells would shoot 18 hour days and the crew were young people, uh, 18, 20, you know, early 20s guys and women. And they would work really hard, but they would, we'd all get worn out. You know, the actors would get worn <laughs> out and Wells would be going strong. He was just yeah. uh, shooting and he was extremely fast, you know. Um, I have an audio tape that I, I'm going to let you play a little bit of, of him directing one scene the first day of shooting yes. here. Um, and it's 31 minutes uh, long. He shot a whole little scene between Peter Bogdanovich and me. And it's six different shots that he planned to use in 31 minutes. And that's really efficient filmmaking. He he did mm -hmm. a lot of shooting that first day. And I was really impressed by all that. Uh, so he was not a, um, a wasteful filmmaker at all. He went over budget a couple of times, but um, not uh, the only time he went, I, I guess, considerably over budget was Lady from Shanghai. And um, there are different reasons for that. But, um, you know, a lot of directors go over budget. It's not that unusual. Oh, yeah. You know, and he, he didn't yeah. do it routinely like people think, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, we should. Why don't we, uh, like Joseph said, he was kind enough to allow me to use a few minutes of that shoot uh, on that first day uh, in this episode. So why don't we cut to that to give you a, a glimpse into Orson Welles uh, directing Joseph and Peter Bogdanovich. Okay, should we set up the scene? Um, sure, why not? This, but this was a scene that got, of course, got uh, cut because Peter then took over the role of of Rich Little, uh, that yeah, Rich, Rich Little was going to play, right? Yeah, Rich. Uh, well, the first day of shooting, Peter and I were cast as a couple of young critics, squabbling critics for you know for fun, and uh, I asked him some rather, oh, well, uh, Jake Hannaford this the main character uh, is eventually played by John Houston, but we didn't know at the time who was going to play that part. Wells said he hadn't made up his mind. He said, it's either John Houston or Peter O'Toole doing his imitation of John Houston. And I told, <laughs> I told that to O'Toole later. He said he'd never heard of that. And he thought that was very funny. He said he was friendly with Wells and they almost made another film together. And, but um, so I, I played a young uh critic and historian who's writing a book on Hannaford and I ask him kind of silly film buff questions and, but some of them are actually rather pointed interesting questions and Wells let me write these questions with him and then he would kind of rewrite them to make them more pompous sounding and comical and uh, then I had to deliver them exactly and but Peter played a kind of a buffoonish young uh, critic and he he had a kind of a Jerry Lewis accent. He was playing it pretty broadly. and uh, yeah. But soon after that, very shortly, he went to Texas to do the last picture show, and that made him a, a big-name director. And, and right. then then uh, Wells began uh, rethinking. He had Rich Little playing this um, hotshot young director who's a friend of Hannaford, um, but he's he's out doing Hannaford. He's a protege, but he's out doing him financially. And Hannaford kind of uh, hits him up for money in a subtle way, and then he gets turned down in a subtle way, and that's really uh, helps destroy Hannaford. That betrayal, which is common in Wells films, but Wells realized Rich Little was not an actor. He said he was a great impressionist. He he did every line in a different voice. And I actually have his script that he left behind. He he kind of just split the production at one point. He left and he said he had, uh, you know, he had agreed to do a certain number of weeks and he had contracts with nightclubs that he had to fulfill and he would have been sued if he hadn't gone back. But Wells was kind of unprepared for this. But he took the occasion to uh, replace him with Bogdanovich, who also loves to do impressions of people and... Uh, it, the conceit of doing every other line, every line with a different voice uh, would have been tiresome after a while. But right. Peter does a few impressions in the film, but he plays it more straight and serious. And so Wells rewrote the part to be more like Peter and more in depth. It's kind of a Prince Hal Falstaff relationship like Chimes at Midnight. Anyway, so in this scene, um, 
Peter and I are sitting on a couch um, interviewing uh, Hannaford, and we both have our microphones sticking out. So we're we're kind of asking questions, and and um, occasionally on the tape you hear Oya laughing a lot. Yes, yeah, <laughs> and, yes. And, and Peter, uh, you know, I, I I just kept doing my lines. Uh, I was not an actor, but I was able to you know remember my lines, and and uh, I did them the same way each time. And uh, Peter was kind of talking to Wells a lot about how do I do this and that, and maybe I should do this and that. He was kind of like being a director. And he and Wells got along well, so he tolerated that. And uh, um, but you know, we did this scene, and it was over, and that was it. But it wasn't in the film because Wells cut the early scenes with Peter as the right. silly film critic. But my scenes in the car with Hannaford, which we shot that day, were kept in the film. And Peter had some scenes in the car, but they were reshot later with him playing his more serious character. And Houston. It took three years to cast Houston in the film. It's, it's a funny story that actually it was not till 1974 that Houston was cast, and I was called back to Arizona for more shooting. Um, I did some shooting in 1971, and I was so thrilled that Houston was there. Um, he was in another room changing his costume. He was wearing like a Hemingway safari jacket and all this, and... He came out. Oh, actually, what I did was I, I uh, opened the door and he was pulling his pants on, you know, with his spindly legs. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Houston. And then he came out and I apologized again. And I said, Mr. Houston, I'm really glad that you're in this film. Uh, I've been acting in it for three years, uh, hoping you would show up. <laughs> and he suddenly looked really alarmed and he said, you've been acting in this movie for three years? And I think at that point he realized what a Michigas he was getting into. Uh, but it oh, was yeah. great great fun to, you know, I was in a few scenes with him. And actually, well, I was one in... thing I noticed about that scene, and, and you can only really see it from no, reading the books and knowing the stories. But one thing I noticed about the car scene is that when the camera is on bugged on houston <laughs> i noticed that thank god that uh rich little was turning towards you guys in the back and it's the mm. back of his head oh yeah yeah <laughs> but when they cut and then when they cut to the close-up it's bogdanovich yeah, yeah. And, and you could barely tell even though he's actually he's much well he's not even he's wearing a different shirt and everything naturally um and I thought, oh, wow, yeah, now I could see it. Like, this was four years earlier, and this was a yeah. different person. And But, I mean, Wells is such a great filmmaker that you you can't – and I've seen the film probably three or four other times, and I, I didn't notice until reading the books. Yeah, he, <laughs> Wells did that a lot in his later years right. because he, he often didn't have the actors present. He said in um, Chimes of Midnight, there's a scene with eight actors. Only one of them was actually – present and the other seven were doubles uh, he said if an actor has his back to the camera in my films that means he's not the real actor he's a double so he did that a lot and, and he, he shot around he, he did those inserts of houston driving the car and, and i wasn't right. involved in that but um there's some funny stories houston hadn't driven a car since 1933 he killed oh, a, right. killed a pedestrian uh, on Sunset Boulevard, uh, who jumped in front of his car, and uh, apparently it had a, a bit to drink, and and they co they kind of covered it up, and they made a deal for him to leave town, and he went to Europe for a while and came back. But those were the days when the studios had the DA under contract, and and he Hi. would do what, do what they wanted. But I innocently asked Houston, um, "Why don't you direct a car? I mean, why don't you drive a car, Mister Houston?" And he said. I like to drink too much. And, uh, but he was driving, pay. Wells had him drive this car and Wells didn't know that Houston kind of had forgotten how to drive. And, uh, Houston was driving a convertible with Wells, Gary Graver and the sound man and a couple of other people in the car. And he, he drove onto the entrance. I mean, the exit route of a freeway, he drove down the wrong way on the freeway and, <laughs> and they were driving against coming traffic and, and oh, Wells, was, they're all freaking out. They were going to get killed. And, and Houston was kind of blasé and he, he did a 180 degree turn across the median and he wound up crossing the other lane and going into a ditch and they all, the car came <laughs> to arrest and And then uh, Wells, uh, Wells made some remark in Houston 
turn to, uh, I guess it was Larry Jackson, who was like a PA on the film. And he said something like, well, uh, uh, just think you, uh, if, if we all got killed, you'd, you'd have a uh, fifth billing in the, in the obituaries <laughs> or something like that. You know, I mean, it was a gag, but uh, yeah. it was. was there, well, I think Rich Little was demanding that, that he was like <laughs> Houston stop driving or to let him out of the car. I know that <laughs> that's in Carp's uh, yeah. uh, 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 book as well. I, I also noticed when I watched it the other night, he keeps Little in it a few times. There's a few yeah. in the <laughs> yeah little uh, little is a party guest he just fits yeah. in as a party guest you know yeah you can't you yeah. know it's it, it's seamless it you know you you can't tell yeah. that he's that other character or, yeah he or just like, pops pops in well you can play that <laughs> play that audio if you want to yes let's go to that uh audio and what listen to orson wells uh directing the scene no you have to walk out turn around right walk in walk front out. of me like yeah, that on action yeah, yeah. All right, here we go rolling Rolling. Scene seven, take one. Good. Good. Okay. Action. What's on your hands? What do you mean? It's on your wrists, too. You've been writing on them. Notes. Notes. I ran out of paper in the projection ah. room. Once again, more boys, huh? More boys. I'd pick the cue notes sooner. Okay. Notes. Mm -hmm. Naturally, what else? Don't mm -hmm. add any syllables, Peter. It's better just as it is, you know. What did I do? I don't know what I did. Uh, say it for me. What's on your hands? Your hand, not hands, hands. Your wrist. What's on your hand? Your wrist, what too. Do you mean? You've been writing on Wrists. it. Wrists, too. Your wrist. Two. Your wrist. Your wrist, too. Then look at it. Pause. You've been writing on it. Notes. Notes. Well, I ran out of paper Notes. in the projection oh room. God. No. Oh, yes. Notes. That's I ran it. out of paper in the projection room. How and quaint. Stick the thing out for it. Yeah. Yeah, like that, and both of you are looking at Gary this time. Okay. Right? All right, ready. Rolling, Gary? Rolling. Scene seven, take two. Women, okay. Action. What's on your hand? What do you mean? Your your wrist, too. You've been writing on it. Notes. Got it. The idea, what's good is, Peter, that you don't see that it's writing until you say the word writing. Ah. You know? Yeah. You see this weird thing, it's slower. You've been writing on them. Right, right. Well, yes, don't notes. fight me when I turn you over. Okay. You don't like it. No. Ready? It doesn't help. Airplane. Airplane. Is there any special way you want me to have the wrist out like this? Don't you do it, I'll do no, it. You'll do it. Okay. You'll be normal. You're, you're trying to listen to Gary's conversation. Okay. Gary's Put it right in front of me. <laughs> Sunday pilots. Drivers. <laughs> What's on your hand? Your wrist, too. Okay. Ready. You've been riding on it. Slate in. Roll, Gary. Rolling. Seat seven, take three. Roll for me. Okay. Action. What's on your hand? What do you mean? On your wrist, too. You've been riding on it. Notes. Notes. I ran out of paper in the projection room. How quaint. Cut! <laughs> <laughs> now. Was that the good one? That's a great one. That's just a great one. All right. What well, one thing I wanted to add, what one thing I noticed was, um, uh, uh, a little bit that he was he was giving, which is sort of what a lot of actors hate, is that he was giving line readings. Oh yeah, uh, to, to say the lines in certain ways. But uh, what was he? Was it more to maybe just give you an idea of what he wanted, or did he, or did he direct that well, way generally? Well, he would. It's funny. He had certain funny things he would do when he directed. One was he he would always say, uh, it's terrible for a director to give an actor a line reading, but, and then he would give you a line reading <laughs> and he, he, you know, he directed, it was such a diverse cast. He had John Houston, who was an amazing actor, but he, he regarded acting. He told me as a lark, but right. Wells was trying to get something deeper out of him. And Houston had started his life wanting to be an actor. He was in the shadow of his great father, Walter Houston. So I think he he shifted to writing because he felt intimidated. But 
he was serious about acting when he was a young man. He played Abraham Lincoln in a, in a play and, um, but he acted in 46 films, but he seldom uh, took it very seriously. Chinatown, he's great in Chinatown, but I think yeah. Other Side of the Wind is his best performance because oh, it's yeah. the, the richest. Yeah. But um, then he had other people who had won Academy Awards and he had some really good younger people and, um, uh, you know, and then some up and coming people. And then he had some civilians like me, you know, who, I wasn't an actor at all. The only acting I'd ever done was an altar boy uh, when I was a Catholic school kid, which is a form of theater. Uh, right. But I was, you know, he liked to mix. Uh, he liked that mixture of people. He, if you look through his whole body of work, he puts in some odd people sometimes. Um, Gus Schilling, I'm just thinking, is in Citizen Kane and other films. And he was a burlesque comedian. And he mixed him in with, uh, you know, theater actors and all kinds of people. And um, but in uh, It's All True, which is a watershed in Wells's career, the documentary he did in South America, that was unfinished, but they, they put together parts of it for a documentary in 1993. A lot of that is with regular folks down there. You know, he, he, he made it with um, the people involved in, in certain events and he mixed in. Uh, 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 a few professional entertainers, but it was mostly uh, non-actors, and uh, he liked working with um, a mixture of people. He, it kind of enlivened the proceedings. And other side of the wind, he he, uh, it's a kind of quasi documentary. Uh, the framing story is what we now call a mockumentary, and right. he pion he pioneered that form, and also an F for fake, which he shot during a little break for the mother side of the wind gary said it only took them nine months to make f and fake he was talking about how quickly wells could actually make a film mm. um it's a mockumentary and um, wells was making a film about an older director coming back to hollywood uh and mingling with young people and journalists and and uh, young directors and actors and and so he wanted a, a mixture of people to make it authentic and he put in right. some some real directors and some other people and so he wanted me as a, a real film critic and um uh various people and, and he said in an interview in 1966 about the film in spain which you can find on youtube i believe he said he wanted personages more than actors in the film he wanted people to play themselves although he wanted basically he he was pushing us to be kind of slightly caricatured versions of ourselves you know sort of exaggerated I, I was the kind of straight laced square seeming guy from the Midwest. You know, I was a little more sophisticated than I come off in the film, but uh, <laughs> I played it as I, I kind of pushed the, the out of touch squareness for comic effect, you know, right. and, and uh, Wells encouraged me and kind of guided me on that. And, and uh, so he, um, he thrived on, on diversity and he directed every, this is a sign of a great director. He's not the only one who did this, but he, I think he's probably the greatest director of actors in film history. Uh, he directed every actor differently. You know, the bad directors direct everybody the same, right, right? but actors are all different and you really have to pay close attention to, uh, uh, you know, I was just watching an interview with uh, Alain Jesua, who was an assistant director to Max Ophels, who was a great actress director. Oh, yeah. And Ophels had worked in the theater, too. And he said, you know, you have to have great sensitivity to the needs of each actor, which are different for each actor, and and not right. force force your conception on them. You have to kind of work with them to bring out what they're good at and, and, and maybe kind of find out things that, you know, like with Houston, I think he wanted him to go deeper emotionally than he had before on screen. And one way he did that, which is another violation of what you're supposed to do, he, he encouraged Houston to drink while right. he was working. And Houston would drink scotch and whiskey or whatever. And um, that kind of, you know, liberated him, made him less inhibited. And uh, but the downside is after three or four or five hours, he would start slurring his lines and get kind of, you know, uh, couldn't act anymore. So right. uh, Wells would call that the um, 
the vodka hour, John, we've reached the vodka hour. <laughs> and so they'd have drinks together and that would be the end of the day, but he got, you know, five hours of great stuff out of Houston. And oh, yeah. uh, at, one, at one point Houston said to Orson, um, Orson, what page are we on? And <laughs> Wells said, John, what the hell difference is it making? Houston said, I want to know how drunk I'm supposed to be. So he was actually getting drunk in the story too. And he gets quite drunk and, but so you know he was playing that up for effect, and he he gives a great performance. And uh, oh, I completely agree. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's he's so good at it. And when I, I I I as soon as the film came out, I watched it and loved it. And every time I see it, my my love for it grows and grows and grows. And I remember when it came out, thinking this should be like the this should be the biggest cinematic event of the twenty first century that we have an Orson Welles movie coming out 44 40 almost 50 years after they shot it and i don't know my my impression was it you know maybe like some other wells a lot of his films it sort of didn't get the perhaps the attention it deserved i mean i know it was on it mm -hmm. got some awards and things like that but uh, how did you feel generally about the way it was well, received? yeah this happened every time wells made a film this happened and it happened to stanley kubrick too who had some odd similarities to wells i mean he was a maverick and they yeah. both lived to age 70 and they both had 12 released films in their lifetime uh, although wells shot a lot of other stuff that wasn't finished uh or for one reason or another and kubrick had unfinished projects like his napoleon but he, he yeah. wasn't wasn't shooting them but the difference is kubrick had the backing of a major studio because his films made money so Warner Brothers right. had this extraordinary relationship with him. They basically let him do pretty much what he wanted, which was great. But Wells had to scramble for money. But um, every time those guys made films, they were so um, daring as filmmakers. They they would do something different every time. And, you know, with certain directors, you kind of knew what to expect, say, with Howard Hawks or Alfred Hitchcock. There was a certain kind of film they made uh, within certain parameters. That they, they would always do something fascinating within that but with wells and kubrick you didn't know what to expect and they really didn't like repeating themselves and so the pattern like 2001 when it came out it got vilified by most of the reviewers until after a month or two the college crowd started discovering the film and college reviewers wrote good reviews and young people discovered that film and they realized they could go and get stoned and have a wonderful trip and all that but <laughs> right. you know it wasn't taken seriously by the mainstream critics who were baffled by it and it took years for that film to be kind of accepted and eyes wide shut was not treated well when it came out his last film and now right. it's considered one of his best and the shining was another example that's a cult film today and so wells's films are usually took about 10 years to catch on as classics right. everybody would say they're you know kane amberson's kane got great reviews but it flopped at the box office because hearst had that boycott against oh, it oh yes yes it didn't make a profit until 1956 when they reissued it and um it wasn't forgotten or anything but amberson's was not well received and Macbeth and Lady from Shanghai were trashed by the critics and, um, you know, and Othello and Mr. Cotton and, and, and Touch of Evil was ignored by the American critics. And, um, right. you know, and this is a pattern with Wells. But I was disappointed in some ways. You're, you're right that the other side of the wind should have been seen as this tremendous yeah. milestone. I think part of the problem was, and I can't say enough in praise of Netflix because they gave carte blanche to the producers to finish this film exactly the way they wanted. They didn't interfere at all. And Bob Morosky did a great job of editing and they were basing the editing on Wells's uh, cutting of 41 minutes of rough cut, which Gary Graver and I had schlepped around to people to try to raise money. And Gary, unfortunately tacked on some other scenes and it sort of gave the impression of, kind of a mess at the time you know and, and people didn't know what to make of it it's hard for <clears throat> civilians to see a rough cut but it's even hard for people in the business to see a rough cut you know you have to have right. a lot of faith but wells established a template for there are two different styles in the film there's the framing story at the party which is a spoof of cinema verite and then the 
film within the film, which is a spoof of arty directors, especially Antonioni, but also Russ Meyer, the sexploitation director who was very, very adventurous in his style. And, and it was kind of like Hannaford is uh, pandering to young people by making a hip uh, avant-garde type film. And Wells partly was mocking that, but he also got into it. You could tell that he was really yeah. doing some, some, some work that he loved. You know, the sex scene in the car is a great scene. Oh, Although yeah. that's that scene in the rough cut was the best scene in the film. And it's seven minutes long and they cut it down to four and a half. And I, I objected. Jonathan Rosenbaum and I were advisors on the other side of the wind. And we, uh, we were brought in uh, late in the game to look at a semi-final version and offer suggestions. And I wrote a 28 page memo, single space, you know, with a lot of suggestions, you know, very minute, kind of like Wells's memo on touch of evil. And they made some of the suggestions and they didn't make others and the same with Jonathan. And we, we got our way on certain things, but um, we both objected to them cutting down the sex scene in the car. And I think it's because it, they did a great job of balancing the film within the film with the framing story. And I, I was wrong. I, I admit in my book, Whatever Happened to Orson Welles, I doubted whether uh, they could, uh, you know, sustain two stories in parallel. And Welles gave an interview to Charles Champlin of the Los Angeles Times during the shooting. And he said, I want the film within the film to be uh, of equal duration. 50% of the film it's running in parallel, you know. And I right. thought, well, I actually, I, I was saying, well, let's cut cut that down because it'll distract people and it's purposely incoherent. And, and but I was wrong; it works really well. It's it's a yeah, it's, it an exper it's it's an experiment that people didn't pay attention to enough. That, gosh, he's telling two stories at once, and the film within the film gives you a window into Jake Hannaford's twisted psyche and his sex fantasies and that's what that's why it's so prominent but what happened was um they discovered very late in the editing process the the orgy in the bathroom which is this very oh, yeah. interesting parody of sort of psychedelic films you know the late 60s there were films like psych out and the trip and various wild in the streets you know with kind of wild yeah. camera camera work and so wells was brilliantly imitating that in the nightclub where there's a band playing and all that but then they go in the bathroom and people are all having sex in the stalls <laughs> and and yeah, uh it's, that it's very interesting very but what <laughs> happened bob morowski told me was he he was um unaware i didn't even i, I never knew they, they shot that scene and bob said he didn't know about it either until late in the process he he was uh, looking at some footage he hadn't seen before, and there were nine hours of uh, footage of, of that sequence. Amazing. Oh, wow. Wells and Oya and Gary really loved shooting that uh, orgy. And uh, apparently at one point, Wells spent six months editing that sequence with another editor, but they couldn't find that cut, unfortunately. So Bob wow. said he just um, put together a short version of it over the weekend, and it's like five minutes long. It's very interestingly surreal. But yes. then soon after that, right after that, they go outside and the car sex scene occurs. And Bob said, uh, well, you know, um, you know, it's it's uh, a lot of film within the film footage. And uh, I think they felt uh, maybe that um, the audience would get distracted from the main framing story if if we were watching the film within the film for too long. So they cut back on um the uh film within the film which is unfortunate because in in the wells version the editing and the camera work which is brilliant by gary graver the color keeps changing and it's um very fast cutting and oya is straddling this guy bob random and in the car as it's going through a rainstorm it's really uh cinematically very exciting and it, it, it builds up to simulate an orgasm uh, you know, with the faster and faster cutting, and, and yeah. she's she's having an orgasm. And uh, but when they cut it, it becomes more about sexual frustration because she doesn't have an orgasm, and she gets mm. kicked out of the car at the end of it very roughly. Her boyfriend is driving the car while she's having sex with another guy. It's very strange, but right. um, it becomes this thing about frustration rather than orgasm. And 
Also, in the original 35 millimeter print, you can see more color shadings than you can see in the digital version that plays on Netflix, just because that is the nature of film is still more sensitive than um, digital. And so right. Gary, Gary's some of the nuances of the visual uh, tour de force get lost. And so that mm -hmm. that's, that's frustrating, but I'm hoping that if the film ever gets out on home video, they'll play Wells's rough cut and you can see the whole scene. Um, yeah. In the scene that we're watching uh, or listening to Wells directing, which is a very unusual piece of uh, audio, um, there, there's not much of him directing films that you can listen to. It's interesting for, to hear him directing actors, you know. Um, oh, yeah. Absolutely. And cam camera people and all that. There's, there's a camera crew outside the window behind us, too. Uh, Eric Sherman and Felipe Herb is the sound man. They're outside. So it's very complicated visually, too. But um, I, you I do I really was... get lost. It's interesting. The film within the film, I, I, it, you're, I could see how you would be hesitant to think that the, you know, that the audience would not be able to get in, get into that emotionally. But I, I, I found it, it like you said, you, you changed your mind on that, and I thought it worked so well too. And it, it almost made me feel like I was at that screening room with yeah. everybody in the house because when the projection keeps. Uh, going out and the electricity goes out and they have to go to the to the drive-in um because i was getting lost in the 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 story of hanover then i was getting lost <laughs> in the film within the film and i was going back and forth and it makes you feel like you're you're there watching with right. everyone i'm, I'm so glad to hear you i, had I a, thought it worked so yeah. well yeah yeah i'm glad I to hear you had so a positive well. reaction that's great yeah Oh, yeah, yeah, it works well. And John, yeah. John, well, John, you know, I you speaking of Jonathan Rosenbaum because you because I interviewed him last summer, and who you mm. mentioned was also a um, Wells historian. Um, he he uh, he had mentioned that uh, he was cri Criterion didn't want to put it out. I don't know if that's changed or well, that's, I, mean, I don't know if you're at, if you're allowed to say, but. <laughs> Well, I don't know the whole ins and outs, but that's not my impression, frankly. My impression is that they would love to put it out. Okay. Uh, I mean, it would be a wonderful package because there's so much material oh, yeah. they could put in, too. I know Bob uh, was telling me about, you know, he has great ideas for putting in additional material and stuff. And there's 96 hours of footage. And, you know, it'd be nice wow. to put wow. in scene scenes that weren't in the film. Um and other material interviews or whatever, but um, I don't think Criterion has a problem with that. It's Netflix is holding it up. The reason is okay. that Netflix business model is predicated on home viewing and not competing with uh, the DVD or Blu-ray market, you know. However, they broke that rule with Roma. They put that out through Netflix. Yeah. You know? And was... uh, the Irishman, they put the Irishman on Criterion. As well. That's right. Right. Those are two yeah. pres prestigious films that they put out and the Irishman's a very long film. And yeah, um, you know, maybe Scorsese had the clout to insist that, but yeah, you know, I don't know what it is. Maybe with if Wells were around, maybe he'd have the clout to say, I want this out, you know. But yeah. Netflix, Netflix, as I understand it, just is stalling on putting it out. They they're not ruling it out, but it's been uh five years now, almost well, four or five years. And um, it, it's a shame because, um, uh, well, you know, as, uh, I hesitate to criticize them because they've made it possible for this Wells film to come out that it, nobody else would do. And and it they have a 190 countries that they show films in, and it's the biggest audience Wells ever mm. had for a film. Right. I mean, I think Wells would be totally thrilled that he his film is playing everywhere in the world and it keeps playing. At the, at the party at the New York Film Festival, we had a party afterwards and I, I ran into a Netflix executive and I said, how long is this film going to be on your channel? And he said, oh, forever, you know, which is Good. nice to hear. Although, you know, don't take uh, it I down, mean, please. <laughs> Do yeah, not that, take it down. <laughs> yeah, I hope that, you know, unfortunately, you know, the Internet comes and goes and there are sites that there was, I forget now the name of it, there was a good film site that abruptly disappeared on Netflix. Criterion Channel is terrific. They show a oh, lot yeah. of films. Um, yeah. But, you know, Netflix has had ups and downs, uh, but they've spent an awful lot of money on making new material. And 
Um, they're doing well and they've set a new business model. And, you know, people like Spielberg were attacking them for a while, but now Spielberg is in business with them because they realize right. that Netflix is a powerhouse and it's, it's, mm. a, it's a big studio, you know. But yeah. um, uh, if it just keeps playing there for a long time, that's fine. But I think a lot of people would love to have a, a home copy of it. And, yeah, uh, I would. I certainly know. would. Yeah, yeah hopefully, and, um, hopefully that'll they'll be able to settle that and put it out for all the film buffs uh, who would love yeah. to have a copy. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, and not only co a good copy of the film, but all the extras and stuff that they're exactly. well, they're known for yeah. great extras on Criterion. So yes. I don't think they're the problem, but I, I'm not privy to all the deal making. But I know that Bob Morowski, the editor, and other people are frustrated that it hasn't come out on uh, home video, and a lot of people. You know, some people put money into the film. You know, they donated money and with the understanding that it would come out on Blu-ray. One thing I should say, uh, even though the two, Ted Sarandos, who heads Netflix, was extremely supportive of the film, and Ian Brick, an executive, was in charge of the production, he's gone now. But he, I told those two guys that they are the George Schaefer's of the modern world. George Schaefer was the enlightened RKO president who let Wells do Kane and, and stood by him. And Wells was eternally grateful because William Randolph Hearst made an offer. I mean, not, not Hearst, uh, Louis B. Mayer made an offer to destroy Citizen Kane uh, to, to mollify Hearst. Uh, Mayer went to the other studios and said, will you all chip in 750000 to buy the negative from RKO and we'll burn it. And, and Schaefer saved the film by saying no. And then, uh, he did Ambersons, but unfortunately, he also allowed the cutting of Ambersons. But Wells was so grateful to him that he, he didn't blame right. him for what happened to Ambersons even. But since then, nobody, no executives have given Wells carte blanche until Ted Sarandos and Ian Breck. Those guys deserve eternal credit. However, mm -hmm. uh, the, the younger Netflix public, publicist people... I, I noticed because I went to the Telluride Film Festival. I helped introduce the film there when it had its North American debut. I, I met a lot of these young publicists uh, who were kind of down on the film. I mean, I you know, they, not publicly, but they would. They made a documentary called "They'll Love Me When I'm Dead," which uh, yeah. Morgan, Morgan Neville made, and that was a phrase or a, a line that Wells told Peter at one point. Um, and it's a documentary about the making of Other Side of the Wind and Wells' attempts to finish it. And it goes up to his death, and it's pretty good. It's, uh, uh, But they spend like a million dollars making it. Frank Marshall, who also produced, you know, Other Side of the Wind, um, did a 40-minute documentary called The Final Cut for Orson, 40 Years in the Making, that Ryan Suffern directed. And... Frank made that with his own money on the side, and it documents the post-production, which is a fascinating process oh. if you're inter interested in filmmaking. And that's on Netflix, too. But nobody seems to know about that. They don't want I didn't you even to, know that. They don't want you to know about it. They don't promote it oh, on there. Wow. But you have to click on a thing that says um, trailers and extras, I think it's what it's called. And you find this documentary. Fr Frank, oh. Frank imposed this on them, made them put it on. And Morgan Neville, I'm told, was very unhappy because he had what he thought was an exclusive deal to um, make a documentary on the film. But Morgan's film ends before the post-production. Yes. The yeah. one topic, the one topic that is not covered in either documentary, but is covered in um, Josh Karp's book, especially, is all the legal stuff that went on. Oh, you know, yeah. for for decades, and Very I went into detailed. <laughs> yeah, I went into some of that in whatever happened to Orson Welles, but that book came out yeah. in two thousand six. But um, that stuff is too sensitive for Netflix to deal with in documentaries. Um, right. But we write about you know why this film was held up and all the different problems that it encountered. And uh, but anyway, uh, the young publicists I think were intimidated because of the Me Too movement was just suddenly emerging at that time, and. Nobody expected that in 1970. I mean, Wells was ahead of his time in dealing with what we now call toxic masculinity. Right. J Jake Hannaford, I think I, I call him a poster boy for the Me Too movement. If you want to look at him, he's he's all the things that people are horrified by old male behavior. You know, he's a sexual 
predator and, and a big part of the film is that he's always seduced the leading ladies or the wives or girlfriends of the leading man because he's a latent homosexual who really right. is attracted to the, the leading men of the film but he he's too repressed to do anything about it until he makes this avant-garde film full of sex and nudity and he, his his latent homosexual sexuality comes out of the closet and he's got the hots for the young leading man played by bob, bob random who's this beautiful young guy who looks just like jim morrison and yeah. Oya, Oya is naked throughout um, the film within the film, but so is Bob uh, Random. And yeah. um, some, some the, you know, the Me Too movement, uh, people, uh, they were worried that people would say, oh, this is a sexist film. Totally misunderstanding the film. Yeah. Right. And so, some, some reviewers kind of, you could tell they had trouble with that. They didn't quite know what to say about this film. I wrote a piece in Sight and Sound, which was partly intended just to be really clear about what this film is, that Wells is satirizing and criticizing Hannaford's behavior, yes. you know, his bad behavior. And, um, but that's why he made the film. Uh, I was there on the set when Richard Wilson, who was his closest aide in the Mercury Theater years, was playing a bit part. And he said to uh, Orson, he said, Orson, what's this movie about? And Wells said, it's an attack on machoism. <laughs> and, which is more more commonly known as machismo right. you know yes. and um, that's what it is and, and he he said that on other occasions but he also said i love this man and i hate this man jake jake hannaford you know and wells was never simplistic about human nature even his tragic heroes just like in shakespeare they have flaws but they also have strengths you know that's yes. what yeah that's what, what makes a tragic character is that they have some stature and some some um, ability um, and, and some positive qualities that are destroyed by their ego and their hubris and all that. And that's true of Jake Hannaford. So he's not just a, a one note ogre. So these younger publicists didn't ha you know, right. have the wher wherewithal to understand him. And so they kind of looked askance at the other side of the window. I was surprised because like we were driving in a van from the screening to a uh, press event at a restaurant and um i was talking about how i was gonna talk to the press about the other side of the wind and one of the publicists said well make sure you talk about the documentary too and i said well, of course i'm going to talk about the documentary and and uh, but in, in other words they cared more about the documentary than about the other side of the wind which is really perverse <laughs> and then yeah. i said it I, I said to one of them uh Frank was going to have a screening of his uh, film uh, Final Cut for Orson. And I said, I have to go. I'm going to see Frank's documentary. And the woman said, uh, you mean the featurette? They, <laughs> they wouldn't even call it a documentary. I said, well, it's a documentary. And she said, we call it a featurette. You know, oh, featurette God. is a very derogatory way of yeah. describing a documentary. They didn't want to admit that existed, you know, anyway. But oh my God. That's, I, this well, like I said, I didn't even know that. So I'm going to have to go. I'm going to have to go search the title in. Yeah. Every <laughs> every time Wells made a film, something terrible happened. For yeah. example, I'll tell you an amazing story. When It's All True came out, it's called It's All True, based on an unfinished film by Orson Welles. In 1993, um, Bill Crone, who was a Welles scholar, and uh, Richard Wilson, his longtime associate, and Myron Mizell, another film scholar, directed this terrific documentary, which includes bits and pieces of um, parts of It's All True, which is a multi-part film. But they reconstructed the um, Jean Gadero sequence, which is about four heroic fishermen who made this epic journey in, these, in a little raft to go to Rio de Janeiro to petition the president for better treatment for fishermen. And Wells shot it with some of the original fishermen, although one a, a, tra a tragic thing happened when they were shooting the arrival into Rio, the reenacting this, um, a big wave hit the raft and one of the guys was killed. Right. And this is one reason the film was terminated by RKO. But um, they managed to reconstruct the entire John Gadero sequence, which is 48 minutes, which is beautiful. And it's silent footage because RKO 
uh, when they said, we're going to terminate the film and bring you back to Hollywood, Wells begged them to let him shoot that sequence because he said the you know, the people in Brazil are extremely unhappy that their, their hero died. And this is the least we can do to pay tribute to them. And so they let him have a Mitchell 35 millimeter camera, but no sound and and only a small amount of film and ten thousand dollars and that was it but he made this 48 minute silent film and um michael schlesinger who's a good friend of mine he was head of repertory for paramount which means their classic film division you right. know he he would restore and release classic films to theaters that wanted to play them and so he was the guy who uh, got that documentary made and um he told me he was fired because of it when paramount executives finally saw the documentary on it's all true they they sent uh, two two guys wearing guns to his office to escort him off the lot immediately and fire him and oh can, can you imagine <laughs> this the crime a crime of making this documentary and i said you know they they authorized the documentary and you know, why did they fire you and he said well when they saw the film, they didn't realize that, first of all, 48 minutes of it was a silent film. They were horrified by that. But it was about poor fishermen, and they were people of color. And uh, Wells was dealing, that was the original part of the original problem. Wells was dealing with blackness. And Brazil has a lot of uh, people of African descent. And... Um, uh, there's there there were social issues involved the the favelas the slums where they were living the government down there didn't want that uh, shown in the film and ah, wells right. was wells was mixing black and white people performing uh, scenes and and dances and then he paid tribute to these fishermen who were dark skinned uh, people and um this ca this caused problems with the the government in brazil but also with rko there was a production manager who was a racist who would send back um cables that use the n-word and wells is shooting oh, a bunch God. of bunch of n-words doing you know n-word dancing and you know this kind of stuff right and um rko th these were the days in hollywood where if you mix black and white people a lot of theaters in the u.s would not play your film especially in the south right. and so uh this was still happening in 1993 and I interviewed Stepan Fetchett, who was the, like the only black male star in the 30s. Hattie McDaniel was the only, she and Louise Beavers, I guess, were the only female black stars. But Stepan Fetchett said, Hollywood is more segregated than Georgia under the skin. I thought that was a great quote. And it's still true. I mean, it was true in 1993. It's gotten somewhat better, you know, because people have put a spotlight on on the problems but, but we still don't have a lot of black executives in in right. the exec, executive suites who can green light a picture and that's where it really counts there there are a lot of great black filmmakers and actors but they don't often get to to make the films they want to make because there aren't enough black uh, executives or, or or white people who are intelligent enough to realize there's a whole market there uh, right. or, or, or many great stories and then when steven spielberg makes films about black people he's vilified you know like amistad i think is a really great film and it got viciously attacked and the color purple got viciously attacked and um you know it's still a racist uh, uh industry and country of course where our mm -hmm. racial problems are even worse than they were in the 90s but so i mean i'm just saying every time wells makes a film he's offending the powers of be. I, I think he's like Spike Lee. He's a troublemaker. That's one reason I love Spike Lee is he always causes trouble. And they're, <laughs> right. they're both provocateurs, but they're both progressive guys. And, yeah. and um, they both love to shake things up and, and that causes problems for them. You know? Can you can you see that it's all true anywhere? The the one oh, that came um, out in 93 the, that you mentioned? I don't know if it's on streaming right now, but yeah. they had a, they did put it out on home video. Uh, oh, okay. Oddly, oddly enough, Mike told me that theaters like say Lansing, I mean uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, college town, you know, wanted to play the documentary, and Paramount said no. You know, they would turn down places they wanted to play it, but they did put it out on DVD, and you can buy used copies of that. It's terrific. I would recommend it, but I'm not sure it's on streaming or not. 
Okay, yeah, because I couldn't find it anywhere, but I'd um, I'd love to see it. The, the The other thing that I found really fascinating in your book, but I also felt bad for you, was that he he was mean to you sometimes, and oh, yeah. well, you talked about that he he bullied you and even made you cry, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and where you stormed off the set. What do you uh, did you ever give much thought as to why he felt the need to do that just to get things out of you, or was that I know he yelled a lot on set. So <laughs> well, yeah, he was he was wonderful with actors in general, and he said there's some wonderful quotes from him where he said actors like at the Cinémathèque Française in 1982, there's a tape and it's on YouTube I think where he says actors are the most important people in a film and we should coddle them and love them and take good care of them and that's that's the way he usually treated actors. He was just wonderful with actors he, he one thing i love about wells is he was great with old people and he loved old people he loved old actors yeah. you know like richard bennett who plays major amberson and he's he was terrific he was losing his his ability to remember lines and so wells would feed him lines from off camera right. and stuff and, but he just wells found him he sought him out because he remembered him from seeing him on stage and he found him in a little rooming house in catalina and <laughs> gave him this wonderful part and he, he he Bennett was so touched and you know that's typical of Wells but he was just great with actors he was so much fun you know the number one thing I'll say that's wrong about when when they make movies in which Wells is a character which happens every once in a while oh, yeah. he's always always portrayed as an ogre being a, a bully and he's not smiling laughing he's just this mean guy um, or, or he's very serious, you know, like Liev Schreiber and RKO 281, which is about oh, yeah. the making of Kane. Um, uh, and um, the only film in, in which they portray Wells, well, there, there are two, I think, that capture the way he kind of was. One is Ed Wood. He he plays oh, yeah. a little, there's a wonderful little scene where he's Ed Wood runs, yeah. runs, <laughs> runs into Wells at, at uh, Musso and Franks, and they both commiserate over the way they're treated by the studios. Uh, although I, I have a couple of problems with that scene. One is um, Vincent D'Onofrio plays Wells. He's very funny. Uh, very, very good. And he, he seems like Wells and he has a certain charm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he That's says, so um, he's, Universal's making me have Charlton Heston play a Mexican, you know. And that's just wrong because... Oh. That was Wells's idea in Touch right. of Evil. The, in the novel Badge of Evil, which is actually pretty good, um, the character is an Anglo detective, and uh, Wells thought it'd be more interesting for Heston to play a Mexican. Right. Um, and he's a high-ranking Mexican government official, and he he's happening happens to be in this town, and he gets involved. It makes him a, gives him more stature, and Heston does a good job. But because of today's PC movement uh people like to you know say oh isn't it terrible that he plays a mexican you know i asked right. heston that once at a public event when we, I, I moderated an event on touch of evil with janet lee and dennis weaver and heston and, and terry nelson who was an ad and i asked heston I, I i i said something wrong i said how did you feel playing a chicano and he said i didn't play a chicano i played a mexican and i was wrong you know and and then he he said very intelligently he said well you know I, I'm an actor I play all kinds of parts I play Cardinal Richelieu in Three Musketeers I played Judah Ben Hur you know in in Ben Hur and he played El Cid you know and he played a lot of ethnic characters and back in those days that was considered acceptable and right. he's his Mexicanness is not caricatured in the film Wells made sure to make him like the most intelligent person in the film he's the guy who is the spokesman for wells's views too you know he's very enlightened about justice and um wells said um he wanted to costume him he sent him to to the best tailor in mexico city to make his suits you know to 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 make him a very elegant guy and he's He's portrayed as somebody who went to school partly in America, and he's you know, a cosmopolitan fellow, you know. Um, but anyway, that's that that scene is is cute though because they're both having you know, they recognize the kind of common bond. They're both personal filmmakers, you know. Um, anyway, the other movie that where Wells is portrayed fairly accurately is Me and Orson Wells. 
Yes, with, the Linklater. Yeah, it's a film so, about him yeah. doing his Julius Caesar play. I like that one a lot. Yeah, uh, Christian um, Mackay um, plays uh, Wells, and he's a Scottish actor, and he, he does a really good job. Yeah, he, I capt so. he, he captures the humor and the warmth and, and, the, and the autocratic nature all mixed in. And he does a thing when he's directing the play, it shows his ability to come up with ideas on a moment's notice. And Wells was great with that. I saw that happen that if something didn't work uh, or if something went wrong, Wells would not like get upset. He would just suddenly come up with a new idea that's better. Right. Or, or right. help help the actors, you know, adjust to something that they were having trouble doing, and it captures that. The one thing it it does that is typical, though, it's about this young kid who's a protege of Wells, and it's based on a real fellow who was a teenager who was part of the, the Mercury Theater, and he he was a part of the Mercury Theater for three years, and he also was in radio plays for Wells and. He was treated well by Wells, and uh, he lived to a ripe old age. And um, but in the movie, Wells fires him. They make him like eighteen instead of fourteen, I think, so that they can have him have a romance with Kristen Dunst, who's good in the film too. She plays a part of the company. But um, Wells fires this kid unfairly, and so they have to make Wells into a shit. You know, in the film, that it's obligatory right. to do that. But Wells didn't fire the kid. I mean, it was just bullshit, you know. But right. anyway, back to me, he was he was bullying to me. But, you know, when I played the tape of the first day of shooting, which I hadn't played for many years after I made the tape, I, I transferred it to uh, digital and all that. He, I realized, oh, he was very nice. He was complimentary about my performance. He said, this yeah. is good, good and you guys did well. And, you know, and... and um, but I thought he had never said anything positive about my acting for three years. He would he would um, be quite harsh and uh, but I accepted it because I was a complete amateur and I was I, I just said to myself I'll be putty in his hands because he's a great actress director and I'm just going to do what he wants and as I said he did let me write my scenes with him uh, he and I wrote the lines and then he would uh, give me the paper to uh, memorize which I could do. And uh, he didn't ask me to do anything terribly complicated. Um, there was the scene on the bus when, let's see, let me just change my video. I've got a video of this scene that um, people will remember. I get on, oh, the, yes. I, I get on the bus, I get, I, I get kicked out of the car. Um, <laughs> and I, unfortunately that scene originally, I was kicked out of the car for a different reason. I asked Houston a question, how did your, father's suicide affect the body of your film work you know and right. um that was a question i came up with because I, wells had told me that the character was largely based on hemingway and i realized that the day of the film it all takes place on july 2nd and that's the day that hemingway killed himself i realized and um uh john houston's character kills himself and so i i said i knew that hemingway's father had killed himself and so i said let's ask about his father's suicide and how it affected his film work. And Wells got very eager and he said, Oh yeah. You know, and he rewrote the question a little bit. And um, I didn't know at the time that Wells thought his father had killed himself. And he actually wrote in a um, um, portrait of his father that was published in the Paris Vogue. Wells edited a special issue of Paris Vogue in 1981. And he had portraits of his mother and father which were fragments of an autobiography. He, he had been contracted to write an autobiography and he could never bring himself to do it. He didn't like right. to reveal t too many intimate things about himself. But in this piece, he said, I am convinced that I killed my father, which was a real shocker of the line. Yes. And wh what he meant was his father was an alcoholic and uh, a playboy and a businessman. And he was the model for Joseph Cotton's character and Amberson's and Wells said, and I guess it's true that uh, Wells' father and Booth Tarkington knew each other as young men. And <clears throat> uh, Wells' father, as he said in a very charming way, he said, my father tried very hard to invent the automobile, which I thought was very funny. He also tried to invent the airplane, but he invented a uh, headlamp for bicycles that he adapted for cars. 
and um he got rich doing that and um but he he was a playboy who loved to hang out with actresses in the chicago theater world and and he traveled the world with orson uh, quite a colorful character but he had a serious drinking problem and um wells was at the todd school for boys with roger hill was his wonderful headmaster very innovative educator he became his surrogate father and roger's wife hortense the two of them they were like mother and father to the kid and uh his mother had died when he was nine and they persuaded him wells said to um cut off his father um you know what we now consider tough love you know if you don't stop drinking i'm not going to see you again right and so he told his father that and um you know he felt very guilty he 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 thought his father had killed himself he died in a hotel room in chicago the death certificate said he died of heart heart disease and kidney disease which is plausible but it was um signed by dr bernstein who was a family friend who was having an affair with wells's mother for oh. years and he was another wow. surrogate father that wells had too this is a theme in wells's work but um Wells, according to Barbara Leeming, is one of his biographers. He unloaded certain things to her. Um, she said, he, as he he claims sometimes that he was present when his father killed himself, but um, mm. I, I think it's more metaphorical that he felt that his betrayal of his father led to right. his father like cutting him off, right? Drinking himself to death, and you know, I think that is the source of all the betrayals in Wells's films. Wells said yeah. of this. Well said, I don't think if you do something bad, you should, uh, and, and you're guilty of something, You, he didn't believe in getting over your your guilt. He said you should right. live with it, learn to live with it, and, and just deal with it and accept it. He said, I don't believe in psychoanalysis and, and um, you know, closure and exercising your guilt and all that kind of thing. Um, so his his films are all about two men who love each other, and one of the men betrays the other. That's usually the yes. theme. And so other side of the wind fits that with Peter's character betraying oh, yeah. Houston. But yeah. Houston's character is an old drunk who's, you know, doesn't treat Peter well either. Right. Um, so it's complicated. But um, so I didn't realize that Wells had this history. And but, you know, it was a sensitive issue, but he he, he leapt on it and he 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 worked it into the film more and more there wasn't a script until 1971 and and then uh, it, it, the last scene that i do in the film i i kind of barge in on um houston and try to say i'm going to help him finance his last film which is kind of crazy you know <laughs> and it, it's it's an interesting scene well shot that in 1974 and I found that in my script. I had totally forgotten shooting that scene, oddly enough. And uh, by then I had learned a little bit about acting. So I thought I was, you know, better than I had been earlier. But <clears throat> I looked in my script and uh, there was a folded um, uh, carbon pages, three pages of this uh, scene that I'd forgotten. But um, th Wells wrote a whole scene for Houston and Bogdanovich about the father's suicide where the father of Houston's character had hanged himself in the Hollywood hotel from a chandelier. And it's a powerful scene in the film. Oh, where, yes. Yeah. Where, um, he, he admits this to, uh, Peter's character who's been investigating his life and, and it's, it's haunted him, you know, and you see posters of his father and I, I, I think I kind of encourage Wells to to bring out that suicide theme in the film. I'm not mm -hmm. sure how much he would have brought it out if I hadn't asked that question. But so anyway, I, I was going to say the funny thing about the scene there you see in the background, that is a scene where I had to do something. I had to actually walk and talk at the same time. I could walk and I could talk, but I couldn't do both at the same time. I wasn't good enough as an actor. I mean, it sounds silly, but it's true. And so in this scene, I'm thrown out of the car originally by because I asked this in, indelicate question. Um, but in the film, for some reason, he reshot it and he had a guy pull up on a motorcycle uh, whose model and John Milius, played by Gregory Sierra, 
and he says you guys are overloaded somebody's got to go and they kick me out of the car which is kind of funny but right. then i i stand on the sidewalk and i i decided to do something poignant uh, and i was inspired by a scene wells apparently shot for uh ambersons that didn't make it into the film um george minifer is seen from the viewpoint of a car and he gets smaller and smaller he's just standing on the side of the road and he's a guy who's against automobiles you know that's part of his oh yeah his his problem and so i thought if i stand there i will freeze myself i'll hold my breath not move at all which is really hard to do because i held my breath for like a minute or a minute and a half and i stood there and i'm like a statue and jonathan rosenbaum when he saw the um the rough cut he said that's the first moment in the film where i felt emotionally moved you know wow. and when we did that scene um if you look in the background there's a white house we shot this in coldwater canyon in la and <clears throat> wells said you see that house in the background and i said yeah and he said contrary to what you've read that's where most of citizen citizen kane was written and oh. that was the house that he had rented when he was doing kane and uh um, oh, wow kale's pauline kale's attack on him had just come out in the new yorker a couple months earlier claiming he didn't write any of kane which is not true that herman Mankiewicz and right. wells really deserve equal credit as robert carringer demonstrated by actually reading the drafts which kale didn't bother to do but wells <laughs> was very very hurt by that and um but anyway, so that was like a little Easter egg in the film. That's the house where he wrote Kane, where oh, we wow. were shooting that scene, you know. So anyway, um, and then I then I'm picked up by this bus that's going to the to the party, and they have dummies of John Dale in the bus. <clears throat> Excuse me, and his uh, cronies Paul Stewart, Mercedes McCambridge, and Edmund O'Brien and Cameron Mitchell are riding in this bus, and so I get on the bus. <laughs> and I'm I'm talking, and, and I have to s speak to Paul Stewart like I'm doing there, and then I, I'm I'm turning and walking as I talk, and I go sit down, and I had trouble doing it, and and I, Wells just couldn't get me to do it right, and finally he turned to Paul Stewart, who was a TV director as well as uh, you know character actor. And um, Paul Stewart had helped him direct his radio broadcast, including um, War of the Worlds. He gave Paul Stewart a lot of credit for that. He said, Paul, could you tell him what to do? And Paul Stewart gave me really precise directions. He said, you stop here, you pause for a second, you say this part of the line, you look there, you, you turn, then you say this part of the line, then you pause, then you do, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so I did the scene in one take. And it was perfect. It was a great piece of mechanical direction. And <laughs> Wells said, oh, uh, what, what did he say? Uh, he called me one take pister after that, Mr. Pister. <laughs> one, Mr. We'll call pister. him one take pister. And Paul Stewart said, I think he might he might become some funny new kind of star, is what he said, <laughs> which is funny. And uh, then when we did the post-production on Other Side of the Wind, Bob Morosky the editor uh at one time i went down there to look at a you know that version that jonathan and i saw and a guy said to me would you come across the hall uh to our little sound booth here and we'd like you to dub some of your lines in the movie again and they didn't warn me about this and i thought geez you know and i said okay sure whatever i'll do whatever you know and uh, i said to them um they had a lot of trouble with the sound because some of the original sound tapes got lost and they were actually working off sound. A lot of the sound was taken from a, um, a work print that Wells had made and um, sort of smuggled out of France. And they had an Academy Award winning sound guy do an amazing job of recovering the sound. But whenever they could, they I was the only living actor that they could have redo my lines. Right. So I, re, I redid 17 lines, which I think is about oh. all I have. Well, you can't tell. You can't tell that anything's looped or... That you no. sound older or anything. <laughs> no, and I, I said to the guy, you know, don't I, you know, I'm 48 years older, don't I sound different? And he said, not really. Not really, no. <laughs> and I said, you know, I, I used to smoke and all. I said, no. So the only thing I did was I, I, I talked in a kind of 
slightly higher pitch to sound younger, I think. But I, I did okay. And actually, it was great to be able to redo my lines because I could read them with a little more sensitivity. Especially mm -hmm. the first day of shooting, I was my line readings were kind of not terribly good. Um, for some of the other scenes, they hired voice actors to replace dialogue if a line didn't sound right. Oh, I see. And the I guy see. who's with me in the car, Howard Grossman, replaced Peter, and, and his line readings weren't very good, so they had some guy redo them. But we didn't change the dialogue. You know, We just did the dialogue better. Uh, mm -hmm. Although he had me do a couple of wild lines, um, you know, in the car, just for clarification of things. But in this scene, um, this was the last, uh, af after I did this the looping in LA, Bob asked me to do some looping in Berkeley where I live. And there's a sound studio here, which is connected to a studio in Hollywood. And so Bob was down in Hollywood directing me in this scene. And we re-looped this whole scene, and um, he told me to kind of do a different inflection as I was turning. <clears throat> he wanted me to raise my voice or something. I said, well, it sounds a little weird to me to do that. And he said, trust me, it'll work with the editing I'm doing. And I, so I trusted him. And But I did that line. I did my lines there 17 times or whatever. Actually, I don't know. This is my 17th uh take but i i did this a, n a number of times over and over and over until bob was satisfied and finally he said we got it this is a historic moment this is the last uh dubbing on the other side of the wind oh wow you. and i said bob wow. you realize it took three directors to get that line reading <laughs> he said well that tells you something about the performance right and I laughed, you know, he said, I'm just, just kidding, just kidding. But anyway, that's the story there. But so Wells was rough on me. He was bullying. Um, he, he was very nice between takes. Like he would call me over a lot. And I think he put me on the set partly as a historian because so right. many of his films were uh, distorted in history where people remembered things that didn't happen and stuff. And so he wanted a guy on the set to be the historian and, so I, I, you know, I realized that and he would call me over sometimes and tell me why he was doing something like, for example, there's a funny scene where Houston is at the party and he walks into a room full of people and this guy charges up to him and says, Mr. Hannaford, Mr. Hannaford, I'm Marvin oh. P. Fassbender. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Houston says, of course you are. Of course you are. <laughs> and uh, Wells said to me, he stole that from Noel Coward, who said that to some fan once. Oh. Okay. I didn't know that. Mr. Coward, Mr. Coward. And then Oya Kodar got mad later that um, they showed the film. Clint Eastwood asked to see the film. Right. And Gary Gary Graber told me they got excited. They thought maybe Clint was going to help finish the film. And, you know, Clint Eastwood presents, blah, blah, blah. He could have done it, but it turned out he just wanted to see it so he could imitate Houston in White Hunter, Black right. Heart. Yeah, and Oya, Oya was, book. yeah, Oya was mad because in that film, he, uh, Eastwood has somebody come up to him and say, Mr. So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, I'm so-and-so. And of course you are. Ah, he stole and it. Yeah. Oya said, he stole the line. And I told her, she told me this in 2005. And I said, well, yeah, but Orson told me that day that he stole the line from Noel Coward. And <laughs> Oya was speechless. She had no comeback to that. So I guess it reminds of, me of what Hannaford says. It's okay to uh, to, to <laughs> borrow from others as long as we don't borrow from ourselves. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, Wells was cheerfully acknowledging where you know he got ideas from right. people and and yes. but oh yeah, you know I, I I was glad that I corrected her on that point. But so I think he wanted me to be in this position uh, when I was on camera to be kind of tense and um, uh, intimidated. I was playing this outsider intimidated character who is doesn't really belong in this scene uh this this scene with in quotes and i'm you know asking these intrusive questions and i'm gauche and i'm you know an intellectual and 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 you know all this kind of stuff and i'm asking uncomfortable questions so he wanted me to be uncomfortable um and it worked but then you know between takes he was charming and the other thing i would say you know for example um when they show him being an ogre in movies, he was not like that on the set. He was funny. He would make jokes. He would tell stories a lot. He was a great storyteller. 
he he entertained people. He wanted the actors in particular to be entertained because filmmaking can be very tedious, you know, between yeah. scenes. We'd sit around for hours sometimes. And I remember one day we were sitting around, it was 11 o'clock at night and Wells was setting up some shot on the rooftop of a house and Mercedes McCambridge was slumped in one chair and Edmund O'Brien is slumped in a chair and I'm slumped in a chair. And suddenly Edmund O'Brien kind of stirs himself and says, ah, we used to make movies and fuck all night. It's just kind, <laughs> of, kind of a memory that popped out of him, which I thought was very sweet, you know? So between yeah. takes, I would talk to these great people and ask them questions, you know, but, wow. um, must have been yeah. surreal to be with yeah. all those <laughs> yeah, it was legends great. and people you had written about and watched all your life. And my yeah. goodness. Yeah, I got to know Mercedes McCambridge well. I took her out to dinner once. We had a wonderful time. And and wow. I asked her about Johnny Guitar. She said, she, I hate that movie. I said, you were great. In it. And she said, I hate it. I hate it. And because she hated wow. Joan Crawford. And oh, right. she said, Joan Crawford threw my luggage out on the highway outside the motel. Uh, you know, and I, but I said, but you were so... <laughs> so intense in that film but um susan strasberg was great to talk oh, to she, yeah. she was youngish but she had played Anne frank on broadway and all that and i talked to her about yes that. um yeah capo was another movie she was in that i liked a lot oh i've still never seen that i should see that oh I'm really oh movie. really good yeah oh, good. yeah it's really really good she, i think it's on the criterion channel i believe Oh, okay. I'll check that out. She's terrific on the other side of the wind. She, I thought she so started. Too. She started out playing a character of Paul and Kale. Wells was kind of getting back yeah. to Paul and Kale, but it's a tribute to his artistry and her artistry that the character became a, a well-rounded, three-dimensional person. And mm -hmm. I think she's she's the um, well. I don't know if I'd say the smartest person in the, in the movie, but one of the smartest people in the film. She's. She analyzes she's Hamilton. Perceptive. She's, she's very, very perceptive. Yeah. Yeah. She she says some of the most acute lines analyzing this guy's problems. And right. That's why he hits her at one point. Uh, yes. Picks up on the homosexuality. You know, she doesn't say it explicitly, but she strongly suggests that. Yeah. That that's uh, was uh, you know, was his sexuality and and things like that. But yeah, I I've I've always liked her a lot. I think she was her. Died yeah. young too. Died, you know. Yeah, she died too young. Uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, he she she asks it very as a question, but it's the most explicit uh, confrontation. Uh, other people in the film make um, innuendos about his sexuality, but she confronts him with it and he hits her. There's a yeah. story about that too. That um, I was worried that because I knew that on Kane and uh, Othello, Wells slaps the leading lady and. And there's a really good book on the making of Othello by Michael McLean, where, who was Iago in the film. It's called oh. Put, Put Money in That Person. It's a very funny book, which I modeled whatever happened to Orson Welles on to some extent, because it's a diary of the shooting of that film. But he says that when he, he slaps Suzanne Cloutier, it's a key scene in the play, um, when Othello unfairly suggests, you know, suspects his wife of, jealous, of uh, adultery. Right. Um, Cloutier would flinch right before the slap because she knew it was coming and Wells was frustrated. And uh, so then he said, no, darling, I'm not going to slap you on the next take, you know. And then, of course, he slaps her and and she, he got a take out of her because she didn't expect it. But then she says, she said something like, oh, uh, Orson, I knew that was, I knew you're going to do that and it's OK or whatever. But I said to Strasburg, I'm worried that he's going to do something like this to you and i don't think it's fair to do that you know to an actress and she said okay let me think about it thank you for warning me and then she thought about it and she did two things interesting she she insisted the slap be simulated and the way you do that and i didn't know this they have a prosthetic arm that can be attached to somebody this was a, a double for houston because houston wasn't there and they had some young guy wearing a safari jacket and there's a prosthetic arm that they pulled out and it has like a hand that will go like this and, and but it doesn't hurt you know when you, you just right. lightly lightly touch somebody and wells is very disappointed and um he said um uh well okay i'll have to find an actress for my next film who's willing to be really slapped you know oh, and God. uh <laughs> but he did the scene and then then she 
when she, she gets slapped, a woman extra laughs. And she's somebody who played Strasberg's assistant in the film, but she doesn't really wind up having much of a part. But Wells said, my God, that's the strangest thing I've ever heard in my life. Polly and Kale get slapped and a woman laughs. Ha, 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 ha. He says, we'll keep it. Ha, ha, ha. You know, he laughed. <laughs> he had a great laugh. Oh, uh, God, yeah. And then, yeah. Um, so Strasberg put that in there to uh, kind of give it a little nuance that there's a bit of... Uh, complexity there a woman thinks it's funny and uh, but mm -hmm. unfortunately in the movie they left out the the laughter uh, yeah yeah so i was gonna say i don't remember that but no it's not in this <laughs> not in the scene it is it is right. in congress but well said we'll keep it and they didn't keep it i wish they had uh, so there uh, are some some changes that i think are you know uh, unfortunate but mm -hmm. maybe they didn't have that on the soundtrack but they could have added that and you know but um, anyway, so to, to make a long story short, um, <laughs> it enables me to tell some funny stories about the film. Yeah, sure. But after yeah. three after three years, one of the we were shooting scenes in Bogdanovich's house in Bel Air when he was off doing Daisy Miller in Europe, and one of the crew came to me and said, uh, "I was watching Russia's yesterday with Orson, and you came on the screen. There was a scene that's not in the film where I'm holding my tape recorder like this, and I'm walking up to the screen." looking up at the screen at the drive-in theater and I, there's like colored fog behind me and, and I have this rever reverential look at the screen and, and Wells said um, when he, after he shot the scene, he said, the high priest of the cinema. And, uh, but when they were watching the rushes, Wells said, uh, Joe looks good up there, but then he always looks good on screen. And the crew member told me this and I was so, tickled that I, I suddenly relaxed and I stopped being uh, anxious and worried as I was for three years because I thought <laughs> right. maybe he didn't didn't like my performance or something because he never complimented me I thought I'd forgotten that he complimented me the first day you know but yeah he never said often with actors he would say that's it's just wonderful and he'd hug them or whatever right. but he didn't do that with me but after that point, I just relaxed and had a good time. The time I cried, actually, that's interesting. Um, I don't think I put that in the book, or maybe I did. But there was a day when, um, see, I'm wearing that trench coat. It's a green trench coat. And that scene was shot in 1971. Uh, when we shot in 1970, I, I had a black trench coat. And I went back to Madison, where I lived, and then... A year later, they called me and said, come back to do more shooting. And I had lost the black trench coat. I didn't realize you're supposed to save your costume, you know. And yeah. Mercedes McCambridge gave me a wonderful piece of advice. She said, when you act for Orson, you keep your costume in a box in the attic. <laughs> and I actually... Yeah, you, you did put that in the book. Yeah, I actually still have the costume in a box in my storage uh, area. I had this... Oh, wow costume but I, I had a different trench coat i came back and i had a green trench coat and wells was very upset that i didn't match and he was we were supposed to be doing scenes on the bus and he he sent frank marshall who now is this you know huge producer but he was just the you know production manager uh pa type guy and he, he sent him all over hollywood looking for a black <laughs> trench coat and he couldn't find one and so wells was uh, angry at me and he was chastising me and i and he said, I can't shoot, you know, I'm going to go home and, and uh, whatever. And I, and I felt terrible that I had ruined a shooting day for Orson Welles. And I was uh, uh, very upset. And I got off the bus and I was comforted by two women who were in the scene, Joan Churchill, who's a well-known documentary filmmaker, and Janice Pennington, who was um, a playmate, a playboy playmate, who became kind of a TV personality and they were both really nice and sweet and they were comforting me, which was very kind of them. But that night I went to the Sunset Boulevard and I was stumbling around Sunset Boulevard uh, crying because I had ruined a shooting oh, day God. for this great director. But I mentioned <laughs> that to Gary Graver, the cameraman, and he said, oh, you know, uh, Orson just wanted to go home and take a nap. You know, he does that every once in a while and he <laughs> just gets mad at the, he got mad at the crew a lot. He treated the he he treated the crew roughly. Um, he, he was a perfectionist, and he, he he was barking at them like a kind of a military commander. 
And right. uh, they were all like, you know, 19, 20, 21 year old guys, except for a couple of women. And, and he would, he, he didn't, he didn't soft soap them like he did the actors. Um, but, you know, he, at one time he, Gary came to Wells and said, um, this is like two in the morning. They had just finished shooting and the crew had to tidy up for two hours. And then they were supposed to come back at noon to shoot and Wells Gary reluctantly said, could we call them at two o'clock instead of noon just so they can right. get a little, a little sleep, you know? And Will said, I can't work in this atmosphere with everybody <laughs> against me. And I was just thinking about that story as, as right before yeah. you said it. I was just, because yeah. Josh Carp mentioned that one as well. And I laughed out loud thinking, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I told that to Josh and Will said, I'm going to go to Europe and I'm, I, yeah. I, I fired the whole crew. And then what happened was this was like a Thursday or something. And then on Monday, they were all called back and Wells just kept shooting and nothing more was said about the episode. Uh, and oh, Charles Hyam quoted that and made a big deal of that in his book as like what a horrible monster Wells was to work yeah. with. Well, that was you know, not not a good episode, but people kind of took it as, you know, I was just reading uh, uh, Max Ophels' assistant director said Max Ophels' Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde on the set, he was a monster because he was so anxious that he would become angry at people if things didn't work out. But uh, as soon as the shooting was over, he was the sweetest guy in the world. And, and uh, right. I, I, I understand, you know, that when you're directing a film and you're probably very anxious and, and worried about it, all kinds of things and, and you snap at people and uh, but right. the crew, the crew um, you know, they were professional people, even though they were young and they, they understood this. There was another episode where, um, oh, yeah, uh, <laughs> Gary told the story that uh, he gave me a lot of great insights from my book. Um, he's, one time he said, Orson, uh, you know, it was like one o'clock in the afternoon. He said, uh, uh, we haven't ha had a lunch break. Could Could the crew go out to lunch, you know? And oh, Wilson, yeah. lunch, lunch, why do they have to go out to lunch? And he said, I'm not hungry. Why do they have to be hungry or whatever? And Gary said, well, come on, you know, let them go out to lunch. And, and so Wells gave him a bunch of money to take them out to get lunch. And they came back like an hour and a half later. They had gone to Hamburger Hamlet and um, had a sit-down meal. And Wells was really upset that they took an hour and a half for lunch, you know, but these poor guys had been working their asses off. And, and Bogdanovich <laughs> told the uh, the, the addendum to that story is after the crew had gone out to eat, um, Wells turned to Peter and said, God, I'm hungry. I'm so hungry. And he, <laughs> yeah, he I remember he, that one. He, he pulled out this huge bag of Fritos and ripped it open and poured them all over this countertop. And they, he started shoving these Fritos in his mouth. And Peter said, I started shoving Fritos in my mouth and they were, they were just eating Fritos for lunch, you know. <laughs> but it was fun. We had a lot of fun. There were a lot of funny episodes. And Wells Wells hired um, two really good chefs, to, French chefs, to cook for us in Arizona. We had really excellent food, you know. And But then at a certain point, the money got tight and we all had to eat pizza, which was fine, too. You know, people didn't mind it because every, yeah. everybody felt that this was the best thing we're ever going to do in our lives in, fil in the film world. And... and um, it's worth putting up with a certain amount of shit, you know. Well, that, well, that you know, it was interesting to read the not only this book, but you had also suggested Gary Graver's memoir, which we've been touching on, who was his DOP and cameraman for the last 15 years and his memoir and uh, Josh Karp's book. And and I also watched uh, Working with Orson Welles, the documentary Gary made. And, and you're right. I mean, even though some of these stories may sound very sour, you know, but but just everybody in that documentary talked with such passion and enthusiasm, even if the story was, you know, him losing his mind or <laughs> they all had a sense of humor about it, um, yeah. which yeah. was which was wonderful. But, you know, we've 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 only scratched the surface on, <laughs> on Wells because we could we could talk for hours. But I just uh, before we close off, I just wanted to to lastly say the the one one thing I that really took away from the book was just his passion and enthusiasm for filmmaking and and you know that he like you had him and Gary shot constantly on so many projects mm -hmm. uh, for years and it's such a tragedy to me that that you know if he was 
he that the press and people at Hollywood looked at him as this failure. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, who cares that he's so creative? It's all about box office and getting things done. And um, they they miss out on what it's really about, which is to be creative and passionate and work with people you love. And, you know, and, and, and the book really, I think any artist would really appreciate this, whether you're a Wells fan or not. Mm. Um, anyone in your actor or writer or filmmaker or painter, uh, I think there's there's so much to be inspired by on this thank book. You. So, well, well I thank you. I tried to um, first of all just you know convey all the stuff he was doing because it's kind of a, uh, an answer to places like the New York Times who said Wells had been inactive as a director. He was active all the time exactly making, yeah he, he had several projects going at once that was one of his things that he liked doing and you know i, I did a biography of steven spielberg and I, and one thing i learned about him is he's a multitasker he he says I, if i'm just working on one project i get kind of stagnant but I, I like to have several things happening at once so that's why even when he's directing a film he'll be producing another and he'll be preparing another and Wells right. is like that, and and people attack him for that. But you know, people have different ways of working. And Wells would pick up, you know, he had like three or four films in production, and he would do part of this. And then if another actor became available for project two, he would shift over and shoot some scenes for that. And but he was working completely with his own money and Oya's, and these are literally home movies. He was making them, uh, you know, he, he, he other side of the wind, he rented a home and. LA, but eventually he bought a home in Hollywood, which was um, not the most fashionable part of town, but it was a, a nice big house that he used kind of as a studio. And he shot this film called The Dreamers, which oh yeah would have been a wonderful film. And then there's the Munich Film Museum has most of his unfinished work. They don't have the footage from Other Side of the Wind, which is now at the Academy Museum, uh, 96 hours, and Don Quixote, which is scattered in several archives. That's the other big unfinished project that right. could be could be finished, but I don't have forty eight years to work on that one. But there may be <laughs> maybe somebody out there, some young film buffs who have forty eight years and they could start working on Don Quixote. Uh, but Wells had all these projects, and um, Munich has put together Stefan Drossler, the curator, put together half hour uh, short uh, compilations of footage from some of these films, and The Dreamers is uh, beautiful uh short film it almost works as you know it kind of works as a short film and wells kind of uh, at one point he said to gary come in here get some black and white film i want to do a speech from the dreamers and gary thought wells was recording this just in case he died and didn't finish it this was a speech that really ties it all together and it's, it's wonderful and then he did um he had an ongoing project called orson wells Ma- magic show Oh yeah, which was a series of vignettes that I don't know why they just can't put that out as a as a film because it's it's a series of skits, and it's very visually delightful. It's funny and it's fast paced and yeah, you he, see some of it in the what the Kodar documentary One Man Band. Yeah, uh, it's he, very he, funny. Even that that song he sings it was stuck in my head. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the he One does, Man Band song, you know. Yeah, that oh, the one man band was a different project. That was um, oh, is that something else? Okay. Yeah, when he it sings a like song, skits. yeah, he he does a, a thing where he plays a one man band and he sings that song. Uh, that's from a TV special he did for um, one of the American networks, CBS, I think it was, and it was suspended because of tax issues. And he he shot some comic skits that um, exist, although one one has visuals but no dialogue um but he also part of that was going to be a 40 minute condensed version of the merchant of venice which he oh right he, he supposedly shot the whole thing and it was stolen by somebody or the sound was stolen is it or the or is... sound was sound was yeah stolen. i heard a couple of different conflicting things about that yeah and uh but stefan drossler has put together a restoration of that partly borrowing sound from other like wells did a recording of merchant of venice in 1940 with his mercury players the guy did so many things in in the book this is orson wells that jonathan edited Uh, from peter donovich book yeah yeah wells's conversations 
there's a chronology of Wells's career that Jonathan did at the end. It's 131 pages. The guy, <laughs> he, he did as much as any 10 artists would do in a lifetime. It's astonishing. Amazing. So it's amazing. when people, wow. people have this image of him as this sort of fat, lazy guy sitting around drinking wine and eating. Yeah, and yeah. That's so inadequate. As I mean, he was working. You know, I think the, the key quote on this is Peter Jason, who's this delightful actor who was in the other side of the wind. And Wells liked Peter so much, he made him kind of like his kind of informal assistant, and he just loved having him around. And um, Peter said Wells just loved shooting film every day. Yeah. He, he just loved the act of shooting film, and in a way, he didn't care if it ever came out because he had fun. And I think of John Ford, who I've done two books on. Ford said, all I care about is going in the studio at nine o'clock in the morning, seeing the guys, you know, setting up and I say, roll them. And that's what he lived for. Between films, he was depressed and drank, you know. But Wells right. was shooting. Wells shot almost every day and, and uh, uh, something or other. And uh, he didn't sit around. He didn't waste time. And uh, he would he would act in some films just to make money he and gary said another myth about wells was that he was poor and struggling gary said he made about five hundred thousand a year from uh acting the and wine. doing doing right. voiceovers he did the wine commercials yeah people made fun of him in his lifetime for doing those commercials for palma son which is a sort of cheap wine but um you know they it's really a double standard because i point out Henry Fonda did commercials for Lifesavers. Does anybody ridicule Henry Fonda? Lawrence right. Olivier did commercials for Polaroid cameras. I mean, who cares? Right. These guys, right. yeah. you know, it's a good way to make money. And, and and But Wells funneled much of the money that he earned from these gigs into um, his films. Yeah. And it yeah. kept him independent. And Jonathan Rosenbaum had a great comment. He said, the true scandal of Wells' career was that he shot movies with his own money. And Jonathan didn't elaborate, but he, well, he did in, in some, some of his writings. But the thing is that Hollywood doesn't like you to do that because that's how you become totally independent. And there's a line in Hollywood they use called fuck you money, which is if you, if you make three or four million on something, you never have to answer to anybody again, you know. And that's kind of what Wells was doing with his, you know, steady income from these different sources he he was able to say f you to the studios and just shoot whatever he wanted to he didn't have to beg beg them for money because right. he really didn't want to deal with these people anymore you know they didn't understand him and um you know the hell with them you know they wouldn't they wouldn't finance all these people who say they love orson wells wouldn't finance the other side of the wind except netflix you know right and right. We, we showed it to spielberg and lucas and eastwood and all kinds of people and um you know lucas spielberg could have written a check out of petty cash for to finish the film but yeah. they didn't they didn't get it lucas said i just don't get it you know i don't understand it and you know i mean right. that's a, that's kind of the hollywood attitude it's a shame but thank god like you said netflix finally did it because to me it's a near uh it's a near perfect film and i i absolutely absolutely love it so hopefully we'll get uh that blu-ray or dvd from criterion or perhaps someone else and just i'll just give a shout out to a couple of your other books uh we talked about last time is the john ford book and i'll leave the interview with joseph in the description box below if you want to hear about that and we're gonna have joseph on again to talk about his billy wilder book which i'm uh looking forward to, to thank you. diving into uh so joseph thanks again this was uh, such a great chat. We could talk for hours about Weld or days even. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's an inexhaustible subject. And yeah, well, you, you exactly. do such great, great preparation for your interviews. You ask uh, really probing questions that stimulate good answers, which is nice. Uh, I really appreciate that. And oh, you're very you. dedicated. And I, I like that. So, yeah. I, uh, we had a great talk about Ford, uh, and, and uh, I'd love to talk about Billy Wilder. That paperback just came out from Columbia University Press. And yes. The Ford book, uh, which I wrote with the late Michael Wilmington uh, when we were young in Madison, uh, I updated that and expanded uh, that to some extent, but tried to keep the flavor of the youthful enthusiasm for Ford. And um, University Press of Kentucky put that out just recently in paperback, so... Um, um, but I love talking about Billy Wilder, so let's do that. That's that'd be great fun. Yeah, certainly. We'll uh, we'll set something up 
uh, sometime soon. But for those of you watching, uh, get the book, uh, which I imagine is you can find pretty much anywhere. Uh, Amazon places like that. Yeah. Or the you know, University Press University of Kentucky Press, we yeah. website or Barnes and Noble or Amazon. Yeah, sure. Fantastic. And that's such a great photo as well. So yeah. get the book and Joseph, thanks again. And I look forward to having you back. Thank you, uh, Robert. It's wonderful talking to you and have a good day. Take care. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I want to thank all of my members on Patreon. If you're interested in becoming a member of my Patreon, head over to the link patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies for full details. Patreon is exclusive content that I create month in and month out. And as a subscriber, you are able to vote on polls and contribute to what I do on Patreon month in and month out. So head over to the link for full details. You can also leave a donation directly to my YouTube channel by pressing the thanks link, which you will find directly below the video frame. Just click on the thanks link and you can leave a donation there if you choose to. And lastly, if this is your first time here, please consider subscribing. It is absolutely free to do so by pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the movies logo. You will see it floating above my head in the top left corner to your top left in just a second. Just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new episodes also click the like button and leave a comment below let me know what you think of this episode also you can also share the episode all of these things are what produce traction uh to my youtube channel so i appreciate you watching and thank you again and i will see you in the next episode